One Friday evening, after finishing a long day of clearing storm-damaged trees, I came home to find the house unusually quiet. The kids were with my in-laws for the weekend, a plan my wife had arranged earlier that week. Normally, a quiet house was a welcome respite after a hard day, but something felt off. When I walked into the living room, I saw her getting ready to leave. She was dressed more carefully than usual, tight jeans, a low-cut sweater, and her hair styled in a way she hadn't done in years. I asked her where she was going, and she told me she was meeting some co-workers for drinks at a new bar downtown. Now, we'd been married for 19 years, and in all that time, she rarely went out without me. It wasn't a trust issue, just a pattern of how our lives worked. She wasn't one to hit the bar scene, and the sudden interest in doing so struck me as odd. But I didn't push. I was exhausted, and part of me felt ridiculous for even thinking twice about it. She kissed me on the cheek, grabbed her purse, and left without looking back. That night, though, I couldn't relax. Something gnawed at me, a small, nagging feeling I couldn't shake. I tried to distract myself with a football game on TV, but my mind kept drifting back to her. After an hour of restlessness, I grabbed my phone and looked up the bar she mentioned. It was a trendy place on the edge of town, popular for its craft cocktails and live music. Nothing about it screamed, co-worker hangout. Still, I reminded myself not to overthink. She deserved a night out, didn't she? But the doubt lingered. The next morning she came home later than I expected, almost three in the morning. I had fallen asleep on the couch, but woke up when I heard her come in. Her footsteps were light, almost as if she was trying not to wake me. When I called out to her, she froze in the hallway before walking into the living room. Her face was flushed and her hair was sort of messed up. I asked her how the night went, and she gave me a vague answer, something about the usual drinks and laughs. Then she quickly excused herself to go to bed. Over the next few weeks, her behavior grew stranger. She started guarding her phone like a hawk, taking it everywhere with her, even to the damn bathroom. She became increasingly irritable, snapping at me over trivial things. The late nights became more frequent and the excuses less convincing. It wasn't until I noticed a pattern that my suspicions began to solidify. Every time she went out, she wore the same perfume, a scent I hadn't smelled on her in years. And her nights out always seemed to coincide with certain weekends when the kids were away. One night while she was in the shower, I decided to check her phone. I have never looked at her phone or had a need to, but the growing doubts were eating me alive. Unfortunately, her phone was locked, and I didn't know the passcode. That in itself was unusual. She had never felt the need to lock her phone before. I put it back where I found it and decided to take a different approach. If there was something going on, I needed proof before confronting her. The next week, I hired a private investigator. Let me tell you, it was expensive for my budget, but that seems to be the going thing these days. Get evidence first before you confront. It felt extreme, but I needed answers. The PI reassured me he would find out what was going on with my wife. He asked for basic details, her work schedule, the nights she went out, and any other patterns I'd noticed. I told him her attire had slightly changed he promised to be discreet and said he'd have updates within a few days. Two days later, the investigator called me. He had followed her after work and confirmed she wasn't heading to the office or any bar with co-workers. Instead, she had gone to a different bar across town where she met a man. The two of them sat close at the bar, talking and laughing. At one point, the PI noted, they held hands briefly before leaving together. I asked if he had photos, and he assured me he'd send them by the end of the day. When the email came through, I opened it and felt my stomach drop. There she was, smiling in a way I hadn't seen in years, with some strange man. 
They were very intimate in those photos. The PI continued his work over the next week. He tracked her movements and discovered a pattern. She would leave work early some days and meet this man at a small motel on the outskirts of town. The evidence was undeniable. Time stamped photos, receipts from the motel, and even video footage of the two of them entering the building together. When I saw the proof, I knew there was no coming back from this. I decided to confront her on a Saturday afternoon. The kids were at a friend's house and the timing felt right. When she walked in, I told her there was a package that was delivered for her and it was sitting on the dining room table. I didn't say a word, just gestured toward the photos on the dining room table. You should have seen her face when she opened the envelope. At first, she tried to deny it, but the evidence was too strong. There was no way she could deny it. Finally, she broke down and admitted everything. She met the guy at a bar months ago. They had exchanged numbers and what started as harmless flirting escalated into an affair. I didn't want to hear her excuses or apologies. I told her we were done and that I'd be filing for divorce. She begged me to reconsider, saying it was a mistake and that she wanted to work things out for the sake of the kids. But there was no going back. Her betrayal had destroyed any trust I had in her. The divorce process was messy, as expected. Her family tried to intervene, urging me to give her another chance, but I stood my ground. I moved out temporarily while we figured out custody arrangements for the kids. By Christmas, we were living separate lives. The holiday was bittersweet, celebrating with my kids while grappling with the reality of a broken marriage. But one thing was clear. I had made the right decision. After the confrontation, the air in the house felt like it was permanently tainted. She kept trying to reach out, pleading for forgiveness, but I had made up my mind. There was no fixing what she had done, not after the lies, the sneaking around, and the complete disregard for our family. I started looking into attorneys the next day. The first call I made was to a local lawyer who specialized in family law. I explained the situation briefly and set up an appointment for the following week. Even though the path forward seemed clear, the process of dismantling a 19-year marriage was anything but simple. The hardest part was figuring out how to tell the kids. They were old enough to notice that something was wrong, especially since their mom and I barely spoke anymore. I decided to sit them down one evening while she was out. I didn't go into details. I didn't think it was appropriate to burden them with the full truth, but I told them that their mom and I had decided to separate. Their faces crumpled and I felt so guilty, even though I knew it wasn't my fault. I assured them that we both loved them and that we'd do everything we could to make the transition as smooth as possible. As the weeks went on, the situation grew more contentious. She refused to move out of the house, claiming that it would disrupt the kids' routine. I ended up renting a small apartment on the other side of town just to keep the peace. It was a far cry from the home I had worked so hard to build, but at least it gave me some space to think. Every time I walked through the front door of that apartment, though, I was reminded of everything I had lost. The quiet, the emptiness, it was all a stark contrast to the chaotic, love-filled home we used to have. Meanwhile, the legal proceedings dragged on. She hired an attorney of her own and it became clear that this wasn't going to be an amicable split. She tried to argue that her affair had no bearing on the divorce and even demanded spousal support, despite the fact that she was fully employed. Her audacity was infuriating, but my lawyer assured me that the evidence I had would work in my favor. Still, the process was draining emotionally, financially, and mentally. Around this time, I started to notice a shift in her demeanor. She went from being apologetic to combative, as if trying to rewrite the narrative of what had happened. She began accusing me of being distant, of neglecting her needs, of prioritizing work over our relationship. 
It was a classic deflection tactic, but it still stung. I knew I wasn't perfect, but I also knew that I hadn't betrayed her trust. Her attempts to paint herself as the victim only reinforced my decision to end the marriage. The tipping point came during a court hearing about custody arrangements. She tried to argue that the kids should live with her full time because my work schedule was too demanding. Thankfully, the judge saw through her argument. I presented evidence showing that I had always been an active and involved father, even during the busiest times of the year. The judge ruled in my favor, granting joint custody. It was a small victory, but it felt monumental in the moment. As Christmas approached, I did my best to create a sense of normalcy for the kids. I decorated my apartment with a small tree, strung up some lights, and even baked cookies with them. Despite my lack of culinary skills, it wasn't the same as being in our family home, but it was a start. I wanted them to know that no matter what, they still had a father who loved them unconditionally. On Christmas Eve, I took the kids to my parents' house for dinner. It was a tradition we had followed for years, and I didn't want to break it just because of the divorce. My parents were supportive, as always, but I could tell they were struggling to adjust to the new reality, just like I was. Still, we made the best of it. The kids opened their presents, we ate too much food, and for a few hours, it felt like things might eventually be okay. The next morning, I woke up to a flurry of texts from her. She had spent Christmas Eve alone and was now demanding to see the kids. I reminded her that we had agreed to split the holiday with her taking them in the afternoon. She responded with a barrage of angry messages, accusing me of trying to alienate her from the kids. I didn't engage. I had learned by this point that arguing with her was pointless. The rest of the day was bittersweet. The kids seemed to enjoy their time with me, but I could tell they were torn. When it was time for them to go to her house, I hugged them tightly and promised that we'd have more time together soon. Watching them leave was one of the hardest parts of the entire ordeal, but I reminded myself that I was doing what was best for them in the long run.